the air in our feet, down the rushing glen. We dare not go a-hunting, for fear of little men. <laughs> We're in the second half of November. December is approaching quickly. For a lot of people, the Christmas season has already started. It has for me, but you're a little more reluctant. You're like, dude, December 1st, wah. But we have a tradition. We have something we do that rings in the Christmas season every year. That marks it for both of us. We know the Christmas season has officially started when we do this thing. We watch Gremlins. We watch Gremlins. Obviously, we are big fans of those two movies, but we realized we couldn't really do a whole podcast episode about just the two Gremlins films. We probably, could have. We probably could have. That's probably what this one is going to be, honestly. But I am actually a rather big fan of the subgenre that Gremlins kind of launched, popularized it if nothing else. I call them little monster movies. It basically encompasses Gremlins and all of his ripoffs. And ironically, the Howie Mandel movie Little Monsters is not a little monster movie. However, Howie Mandel is also the voice of Gizmo. <laughs> I, I kind of lost my point. The point is that's our topic today on the Bangers and Mash Show. What you're telling the audience is that we're going to talk about Gremlins 1, Gremlins 2, and a bunch of literal shit. I think some of the knockoffs are entertaining. It's fair to say most of them... Just say yes. It's fair to say most of them are perhaps of a lesser quality. Of a lesser... You mean literal shit. (laughs) Your negativity is bringing this podcast down. We've got like 16 movies to talk about, so I think we should just... 16! (laughs) Alright, let's fucking start. Billy Pelser has a nice home, a nice girl, and loving parents who were about to give him the most unusual gift he ever got. But there are a few things to keep in mind. If you expose it to the light, you may hurt it. If you get it wet, it will multiply. And most important, no matter how much they beg, never let them eat after midnight. They become clever, mischievous, and dangerous. Gremlins, huh? Little monsters. Gremlins. They'll be expecting you. First movie on the list, 1984, Gremlins. One of the best Christmas movies ever. From my understanding, it's one of your all-time favorite films. Oh, it's way up there, yeah. I went through a period where I wasn't that crazy about Gremlins. I thought it was an unbalanced film with a schizophrenic tone. And those things are true. However, the older I get, the more I love this movie and the more I enjoy it. I have a very strong nostalgic connection. This movie scares the shit out of your sister, so... Yeah, I guess I should definitely share that story. I have a sister. I've mentioned her before on the show. She's ten years older than me. She was six in 1984. When Gremlins came out, they advertised it mostly with, oh, look, cute little gizmo. And my Great mother- marketing scheme, by the way. Well, yeah. Lead with the cute thing. She insists that my mother take her to the movie. And they go to film first half an hour, Gremlins is this cute little critter, and then the Gremlins show up and it becomes a horror movie. And my sister was screaming and terrified because she was six years old. Her father refused to leave the theater saying, I spent eight dollars on this to take us to this movie. She's gonna sit here and she's gonna damn well watch it. Of course, now eight dollars will get you one ticket, if you're lucky. Six, I guess, is a little young. But I think at six, I probably would have loved this film. I did. Yeah. Great blend of comedy and horror. One minute you're laughing, one minute you're crying. It's a funny tones that you're talking about, I think, are what I like the most about it. This is a pretty good starter horror movie. This would be a good first horror movie for a young kid. Yeah, probably. It was an early one for me. It is one of the defining hits of the 80s. This movie was huge back in the day. It is one of those iconic 80s movies up there with Indiana Jones and Back to the Future. Definitive Little Monsters movie. If we think of the Little Monsters subgenre, this is really the film that started it. It has almost a fairy tale tone. It begins with the father 
father narrating and it ends with him narrating. And there is a very simplistic moral to the film of perils of the modern world and the simplicity of nature. More importantly, you need to listen to your elders because they have wisdom. The movie blatantly references World War II folklore where the modern conception of gremlins come from. Dick Miller's character talks about gremlins brought down the planes in WWII as he calls it. His character likes to go on these quasi-racist rants about how foreigners put gremlins in the cars and the TVs to make sure they don't work. This movie is also a take on the magical pet story type. Who watched this movie the first time I didn't want their own gizmo? I still want my own gizmo. <laughs> I wanted my own gizmo so bad that when the Furbies came out in the 90s, my grandmother went and waited in line oh, wow. to get me the one Furby that looked like gizmo. Not the gizmo licensed Furby. Okay, yeah, because that happened later. Regular Furby that just so happened to look like gizmo. That's pretty adorable. And why is gizmo so appealing? He combines the mutual appeal of teddy bear, panda, and a bunny rabbit. And the dog. Yeah. Because he's loyal. The big ears. Such a simple thing, but really makes it an iconic image. He looks like a live action version of Rio. I see it, yeah. Gizmo and the Mogwai was a Pokemon for the 80s. Kids in the 90s would watch Pokemon and think, oh, I want my own Pikachu. And kids in the 80s watch Gremlins and went, oh, I want my own Gizmo. Yeah. (laughs) The result of three very distinctive authorial voices. Joe Dante directed this film, who previously did The Howling and Piranha. We talked about The Howling on a Werewolf episode. Yeah. Steven Spielberg produced the film and had quite a bit of input on it, from what I understand. The screenplay was written by Chris Columbus, who would go on to make the Home Alone films. This movie shares something of a kinship with the first Home Alone. I didn't know that the third guy was involved. I knew well, obviously, Spielberg and Dante, their styles really stick through on this. this the first half of the movie where Gizmo's being cute is very Spielbergian. The second half, when the gremlins show up and things start going crazy, is very Dante-esque. Do you remember the name of the town? No. Kingston Falls. This idyllic town in upstate New York. It feels very much like a throwback from the 50s. The town has that simplistic 50s setting. In the movie, they reference It's a Wonderful Life, which of course mm. took place in Bedford Falls. Spielberg and Dante have two very different approaches to that baby boomers 50s nostalgia for the simple small town. Spielberg obviously loves that kind of setting. Dante takes a bit more joy in destroying it, mm-hmm. which is very much what this movie is about. Yeah, and then that score. The Jerry Goldsmith score is great, you know? That main theme. Yeah, that. It works two ways. It has a very oriental tone to it. The Mogwai's origins are in Chinatown. But at the same time, it has a high-pitched trill to it that reminds you of the gremlins singing and their laughter. Yeah, great score. We have to talk about the creature effects in this film. Oh my god. Which are still incredible to this day. Chris Wallace, who would go on to do the effects for The Fly, did the effects for this movie. Design of the gremlins and the Mogwai, I would describe them as intuitive. You look at them and they're perfect. They make sense mm-hmm. immediately. I love the gremlins design so much that I cannot imagine a world without it. You actually look at the gremlins versus the Mogwais and you can see how the gremlin evolved from the Mogwai. Well, yeah, there's this continuity. They both have the big ears. The gremlins effect, they're scaly, they're greasy, but they're still very expressive. That scene where they throw Stripe into the pool, at the very end where the light hits him, and, and he it starts bubbling and oh, yeah. melts into a skeleton. Huey skeleton jumps up out of the fountain. Yeah, that's what I love, that jump scare where Stripe skeleton leaps out of the fountain, then the skeleton melts. He completely dies. And they did that shit without CG. Something that we respect so much about 80s monster movies, the latex monster movies as I call them. The special effects are characters. They have personality. They contribute to the story. They add something deeper to the film. You can look at the gremlins in this movie and they have expressions and they each do something special. Even in the theater scene, you can look at the gremlins and tell how each and every single one of them has almost their own personality or their own gimmick. I don't want to put down CGI too much because there are great CGI artists. There have been great CGI characters. Like the Hulk in the Avengers. Or Rocket Raccoon in Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, yeah. Mostly anything Marvel's done with yeah. CG. <laughs> Physicality, the textileness. The textileness, is that a word? It is now. The puppeteer adds this extra sense of personality and character. So they're not just rubber monsters. The computer designer who is sitting there designing the character is not an actor, whereas the puppeteer is an actor. We referenced Gremlins as a horror movie. We would agree that this is a horror film, though it is a horror comedy, and it is a lighthearted horror film for most of its runtime. Yeah. That middle section after Gremlins first hatch, rewatching it, it is dark. The film builds up to it. the first element of horror is when stupid fucking Corey Feldman spills water on Gizmo. He, for lack of a better term, gives birth. It's not even like birth, it's like a cell dividing. Again, done with practical effects. Oh, of course. The only non-puppetry effect in this film is when Stripe reproduces, there is some stop motion. It's actually a really cool shot. It's a long shot of the street. You see Stripe walk out of the darkness, and then you see a thousand gremlins walk out behind him. Only moment of stop motion in the film. Everything else is done with puppets. Think about the scale of the special effects in this film. This isn't just one monster, this is hundreds of monsters. I can't imagine how difficult this movie must have been to make. As a horror film, the first moment that things are gonna go wrong is when the evil Mogwai string up the family dog 
and the Christmas lights. That's the first indication that this is gonna get dark. Yeah. Black Eye dies first. I think they do that intentionally. I honestly don't think it was an intentional thing. There was some controversy over this at the time that the only black character in the movie gets killed. Joe Dante said we weren't being intentionally racist guys. You think they're commenting on the group yeah, of the black guy? Yeah, that's where I was going with that. Was that a troop yet in 1984? Feel like it probably I feel like this was. is one of the movies that codified the troop of the black eye does first. First time you get a look at the gremlin when Billy is in the school, the bathroom mirror door comes open and bang, there's a gremlin and that's your first look at it and that is still a pretty decent jump scare. Right? Hello, Billy. The sequence where the mom is alone in the house is... Which, uh, by the way, way to go, mom. She's badass. She fucking stabs one <laughs> with a knife. I mean, she just goes black ops on them sons of bitches. <laughs> and something I've never <laughs> noticed before is you can see the dead gremlin with the knife stuck in his chest in the background. And that's the kind of detail you wouldn't notice on a VHS. You should see it on blue. And which do you prefer? Do you like the gremlin in the food processor or the microwave better? I'd say the food processor because the legs You see the spinning. legs spin around. Yeah. Like, the legs spin around once, they hit the cabinet, and then they keep going. The gremlin in the microwave was the moment for me when I first saw this movie as a kid where I went, this movie's awesome. Yeah, that answers the question. What would happen if you stuck something <laughs> living in the microwave? It will explode quite spectacularly. Very famously, it was one of the movies that caused the creation of the PG-13 rating. And I guess for a PG movie, this is pretty violent. <laughs> the violence is mostly stylized. It's all get, green blood. There's no red blood. Yeah, when the gremlin gets its head chopped off and the decapitated head flies into the fireplace, still screaming as it's burning. Yeah, it's graphic, but it's cartoonish. Yeah. The gremlins are monsters, but I would make the case that they're satirical anti-heroes. Subplot about Mrs. Daigle, the mean, rich old woman, owns most of the town, and she seems to have evicted, or it's close to evicting, a lot of the families in the movie. Yeah. In the bank scene with Billy, she threatens to kill his dog because it jumps up on her. When she's threatening to kill the dog, that means you're going to die. If you threaten to kill a dog or you kill a dog in a horror movie, you're the next one to die. We despise this character, and she gets one of the best deaths in the oh movie. Oh my god. She has shot out the roof on her yeah. stairlift. That's the, amazing. Yeah. Gremlins, in mythological terms, are famous for messing with technology. It goes <laughs> flying up the stairs out the window. It's amazing. Even though the Gremlins are the antagonist of the film, the movie likes them. And that's most apparent in the humor of the film. Like the bar scene? The bar scene it was is... was a flasher? The flasher <laughs> or the flash dance Gremlin. Oh my god. Which is a really random ass reference. <laughs> or the one on the ceiling fan I love. I actually love it when Phoebe Cates puts it's the fan, fan on high and it flies <laughs> off into one of the lights. The one that really made me laugh this time while we were watching the movie. But all this insanity is happening in the bar. It is sort of funny that Phoebe Cates still worked in the bar even though it's full of fucking monsters. And in the corner, sitting by himself, is a sad gremlin with a cigar and a glass of whiskey and a hat pulled down. Another gremlin with a little hand puppet comes in and starts making these cute little noises. <laughs> On this rewatch, that scene really cracked me up. That's what I was talking about earlier, how every single gremlin had its own personality. They all dressed differently. They were almost like little people. And what about Snow White? And that's such a kooky element. Billy, Kate, and Gizmo go into the theater and he says they're watching Snow White. And they love it. Yeah. And I always love the gremlin with the popcorn bags. Oh, this yes. is, I don't know why that cracks me up so much, but it does. I just, oh, God. Why hasn't Decca made a figure of that? <laughs> so we talked about this movie as a Christmas movie. One of the things I love about gremlins is it fucking hates Christmas. If Joe Dante is tearing down the sanctity of the small town, he is targeting Christmas pretty heavily, too. Because the gremlins yell Christmas carols. The mother gets attacked by the Christmas tree. And the gremlin is trying to garrot her with a piece of pencil. One of my favorites is when the cops go into the town and they see this guy in a Santa Claus suit and they say, oh, that's Bob. He plays Santa Claus every Christmas. There are seven gremlins on him attacking him. They fucking killed that guy. They killed Santa Claus. <laughs> Speaking of the death of Santa Claus, I think the most infamous anti-Christmas moment in this movie is Phoebe Cates' monologue about... Oh, God, yes. That's how I found out there was no Santa Claus. It was Christmas Eve. I was nine years old. Me and Mom were, were decorating the tree, waiting for Dad to come home from work. A couple hours went by. Dad wasn't home. Mom called the office. No answer. Christmas Day came and went... And still, nothing. So the police began a search. Four or five days went by. Neither one of us could eat or sleep. Everything was falling apart. It was snowing outside. The house was freezing. So I went to try to light up the fire. And that's when I noticed the smell. The firemen came and broke through the chimney top. And me and Mom were expecting them to pull out a dead cat or a bird. And instead, they pulled out my father. He was dressed in a Santa Claus suit. He'd been climbing down the chimney on Christmas Eve, his arms loaded with presents. He was going to surprise us. He slipped and broke his neck, died instantly. And that's how I found out there was no Santa Claus. 
It's so sad that you laugh. <laughs> it is darkly funny. Fucking balls it took to put that in a screenplay. They put that scene in a movie that is marketed towards kids. The cast in this film, pretty great. Zach Galligan, whom I've met. Perfect, innocent, small town, boy next door. Phoebe Cates is the perfect, innocent girl next door. Is equal. Dick Miller, who is in, if not all of Joe Dante's movies, then most of them. His greatest, Mr. Futterman. This is a meaty part for Dick Miller. Judge Reinhold, Hoyt Axton, the real Don Steele is Rockin' Ronnie. If you're not in the right mood for the movie, it can rub you the wrong way. But if you're like us and you've seen this movie a million times and you love it, I can't really be objective about Gremlins. I fucking love this movie. It's a great movie. Remember the last time we told you not to feed them after midnight. We told you to keep them away from the light. And the most important warning of all, we told you to never, ever get them wet. You didn't listen. They're mutating. Now, was that civilized? No, clearly not. Fun, but in no sense civilized. For many years, Warner Brothers was trying to talk Joe Dante into making a sequel, and he didn't want to do it. Eventually, they cut him the right size check and promised him complete creative control over the sequel, which is very evident in the belated sequel, 1990s, Gremlins 2, The New Batch, which is a fantastic sequel. Oh, yeah. It is much loonier. Yeah. I don't know if it's a good movie, but it's... No, it's a great movie. Okay. Some people say it's better than the first one. No. It's real hard to pick. I think I like the first one more, but this is a damn good sequel, man. I yeah. Think you can tell that Dante was given more control. The movie begins with Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny. Yes. And this is your indicator that this is going to be a madcap, wacky, wacky comedy. It's been a couple of years. Billy and Cade have moved to New York. Billy is working in the Clamp building, which is owned by Daniel Clamp, who is this billionaire who has built this super advanced skyscraper. He owns a cable channel, several. And one of the things they talk about is he colorizes movies, which is a pretty clear jab at Ted Turner. Gizmo is found again. Gizmo gets wet. He births more mogwai, so we eat after midnight. And then they go nuts in this high-tech building. That's the problem I have with the movie. What's that? What they learned the first time? They tried their best not to get Gizmo wet. He's hiding in Billy's desk when John Aston comes up to the water fountain. Water sprays out over the room, lands on Billy's easel, runs down the inlet, and hits Gizmo on the head, and that's how it happens again. Wow. Uh-huh. What a strange series of coincidental events. Everything in this film is you know, pretty the... unlikely. Rick Baker did the effects for this one, not Chris Wallace. And some people are critical of Baker's effects. They say the first, the effects in the first one are better. And I think they're pretty even. I think the ones in the first one are a little bit better. They're a little slimier. The gremlins, the individual designs are more varied in this film. Yes. That central troop of gremlins, Larry, George, Daffy, Mohawk. It's not Stripe, it's Mohawk, but it's almost the same character. And they each have a personality. Daffy has the goofy eyes, bouncing off the walls. Part of the skyscraper is a genetics laboratory. And who's the scientist? Why, it's Christopher Lee, of course. One of the many small gags, and this film truly benefits from a rewatch because there's so much happening. But one of the great small gags is as you walk into the genetics lab, you see a guy leading a cow, and the cow has a device on its head. And you can hear the device saying, I enjoy giving milk. This is a device they build to read the thoughts of bovine. There are some perhaps unethical experiments going on in there. That's how Gizmo gets in the tower. The scientists find him and bring him up there. And they make them do a little dance. I love that. The main thing you're referring to is the super gremlins that we are introduced to in this movie. Oh, yes. The super gremlins. Brain. Brain. Who's really smart and able to communicate for his Who time. speaks and has glasses on and dresses and talks with Tony Randall's voice is my favorite gremlin. The bat gremlin. The bat gremlin. The spider the gremlin. The spider gremlin who's great. The vegetable gremlin. Oh my god, I love the vegetable gremlin. The veggie gremlin that burps all the Did time. Did they make a toy of that? They haven't made a toy of the veggie gremlin, no. They should. They should. Retta, the female gremlin, or femlin, if you will. Is she really a super gremlin? She is genetically engineered. That she and has boobs? She has boobs, yeah. The gremlins don't have genders. Any one of them can reproduce. Most of them would identify as male. So I feel like there are a lot of cross-dressing gremlins. And Greta is the only real female gremlin. Oh, lord. Lightning gremlin, which becomes yes. a plot point. Most everyone's favorite is the spider gremlin. Really cool set piece. NECA made an awesome figure of this last year. Yeah, the spider gremlin's awesome, but I think Brain is my favorite. He's hilarious. The gremlins are destroying the stock market inside the building. You can hear them yelling on the phone. One is yelling, Buy, buy, buy. The other one's yelling, sell, sell, sell. Brain says, we're telling our customers to invest in shotguns and canned food. When Brain is on the talk show, the horror host in the building, who is not Grandpa Munster, becomes this gorilla newscaster, Long Duck Dong from 16 Candles as a cameraman. Long Dong? Yeah, Long Duck Dong from, you've never seen 16 Candles? No. Oh, man. They're interviewing Brain, and they ask him, what is it that you want? Well, we want what everybody wants. We want civilization. Grumman with a beanie comes up behind him, and he shoots him, and he says, now, was that civilized? Obviously. 
obviously not fun, but not civilized. New York is such a big place. Broadway shows, someone will have to tell us how to get into those. And all the street crime, I believe we can watch that for free. Brain is great. This movie is much more of a comedy than a yes. horror film. There's very little horror in this. The gremlin comes out of the control panel and bites the dude in the neck. The one gremlin gets put in the paper shredder. But mostly this is a comedy. The film makes fun of the first one. The first movie, Phoebe Cates, has this tearful monologue about Christmas. And in this one, somebody mentions Abraham Lincoln. And she says, don't mention Lincoln's birthday to me. <laughs> She's about to tell the similar monologue. Billy says, Kate, okay, we don't really have time for this. I think the biggest joke is Leonard Maltin's cameo. He obviously has some sort of TV show, a movie review show, remember those? He's giving a negative review to the first Gremlins on VHS. <laughs> Gremlin sneaks up behind him and garrots him with a reel of film. The most meta scene in the movie is where the Gremlins get into the projector and they interrupt the film itself. <laughs> they put on a nudie movie. You see a mother leave the theater and complain to the usher played by Paul Bartel. His reaction, he goes into the audience, he finds Hawk Hogan and he gets Hawk Hogan to stand up and tear his shirt off and yell at the Gremlins until they put the movie back on. <laughs> the fucking balls, the giant brass balls in this movie to do that shit. Every awesome idea the writer had went in the movie. It had to have been written by a 12 year old, right? Because, I mean, Hulk Hogan was in it. <laughs> do you think the Grimsters can stop the Hawkster, brother? Brian Glover plays Mr. Clamp, and he is hilarious. The great scene where he puts on a tape. Civilization as we know it has come to an end. We hope you enjoyed our programming, but more importantly, we hope you enjoyed life. And it's images of the American flag blowing in the air, and bunnies, birds, fawns, and the forest and streams. Yeah, here's a few things to remind you of what we've lost. Or when he says, oh, I'll finally get to use my secret tunnel exit. So much great stuff. And did we mention the musical numbers? At the end where all the gremlins congregate the main hall of the building and they sing New York, New York. Oh. And we didn't mention what Gizmo's been up to throughout this whole movie. Apparently, Joe Dante hated Gizmo. He thought Gizmo was sickeningly cute. So this whole movie, Gizmo is being tortured by the other gremlins until they push him too far. You see him lifting weights. He has a training montage. Ties a red bandana around his head. Turns himself into Rambo and sets the spider gremlin on fire. It's amazing. We mentioned the bat gremlin who flies through the wall of the lab and leaves the Batman symbol on the wall. Mm -hmm. But a joke I had never noticed before that I noticed this time. When the Bat Gremlin transforms, the film moves over to Christopher Lee, zooms in on his face with this look of indignation. <laughs> That's a reference to a thing I know. Congratulations! Or the Phantom of the Opera Gremlin. A gremlin picks up a bottle of acid that says, do not throw in face. What does he do? Throws it in the gremlin's face and the gremlin puts on a Phantom of the Opera mask. I love the first film. And I think I love the first film more, but this sequel is everything you could have expected from a gremlin sequel. Yeah. What if a bat and a gremlin got together? <laughs> yeah. What if a radioactive spider had been a gremlin? And God bless Warner Brothers for cutting him the check and let him do it. This is thus far the last film in the Gremlin series. This continues to be a license that people know and a beloved series of films. There's always a lot of merchandise. Talks. I think that's why it hasn't moved on. There have been talks for years about a third film. I know at one point they asked Dante back for a third film and he said he'd only do it if there was no CGI. There have been rumblings of a remake a couple of times throughout the years. As of now, there is no new Gremlins film forthcoming. Gremlins 3 is up there with Ghostbusters 3. One of those things we've been talking about about for years and we don't know if it'll ever get made. And Although I, Ghostbusters 3 is looking... Well, yeah, now it is moving forward. That's a different show. If Ghostbusters takes off... We're going to see a lot more 80s franchise revived. I really think that's when we'll get our Gremlins 3. These two movies are so perfect. I don't know if I want to see a new one. Where do you go from Gremlins 2? Yeah. Of all the planets in the galaxy, they chose ours. They hide in small places. They light the dark. There's nothing cute about them. They've come a long way, and they're hungry. Critters. They bite. The first Gremlins was an enormous box office hit, one of the top grossing films of the year. As I said, for a long time, there was no sequel. To fill the gap where there was no sequel, a lot of low-budget studios stepped in and made what could charitably be called knockoffs. Films that owe an unprecedented amount to Gremlins. I think the best of the Gremlins ripoffs is Critters. Yeah. There are four Critters movies. They're all from New Line Cinema. Now, what is Critters about? How does it differentiate itself from Gremlins? Because it's about aliens? Yeah, they're from space. The Krites are the name of the Critters. They escape from a high-tech space prison, and they head to Earth. These two bounty hunters, who have no faces of their own, are on their trail, and the Krites land in Kansas and attack this family. Bill Krites. The director denies that Critters is a ripoff of Gremlins, and I call... Mm. 
bullshit on that. Aside from all the sci-fi stuff, the premise is almost identical. Little, goofy, but dangerous monsters set loose on a small town. There's a family at the center of it. Critters giggle, they have high-pitched laughter, they disrupt electronics, and they act very goofy. One of my favorite moments is when the critters roll into a ball. It's on fire and it rolls into a commode. Another one is trying to talk to a doll of E.T. and it bites its head off, which is both a pot shot of E.T., I think, and a reference to Dee Wallace. Plays the mom in this film, because of course she does. The debt that Critters owes Gremlins is blatant, and to say that it's not a ripoff is pretentious, because it is. Which isn't to say that I don't like this movie. Gremlins is upstate New York. This is somewhere in bumfuck Kansas. Bum Grover's Bend is the name of the town. That change of scenery is fun. While Gremlins, the whole town is being menaced, and this it's mostly one family, because this was a much lower budget film. Sci-fi elements are pretty fun. The space prison is cool, and the warden of the prison is the slug guy, is in this floating chair. And I like the space bounty hunters. Yeah, they're cool. Ugh. And I love Ugg. Ugg is cool. And then the other one, I don't know his no name. No one cares about him. Yeah, nobody cares about the other guy. But Ugg is cool. From a screenwriter perspective, they spend most of the movie tooling around town, getting in misadventures, picking fights in bars and stuff. And it's pretty clear that the only reason they don't go straight to the farm is if they did that, the movie would be over immediately. The script has to delay the bounty hunters as long as possible. Okay, maybe a little tedious, but whatever. The reason the Critters movies are well-liked is the monsters themselves work well. Yes. The Krites are amusing. You said you didn't really care for the giant Krites. What happens? at the end of this movie there's a bunch of little ones and then one stays in the chicken coop and eats all the chicken and then grows to a larger size and I was going to say I thought they grew as they ate I think it's how much they eat I think the more they eat the bigger they get so they grow as they eat sure introducing one big right misses the appeal of the little monster movie where there's a bunch of small monsters maybe okay maybe not critters split the difference between gizmo and stripe they're fuzzy they're these killer fuzz balls they have mouths full of a lot of teeth big glowing red eyes and one of the cooler things is they shoot poisonous barbs that paralyze their foes. Yeah, and they roll in the balls, which is cute. Best jokes in the movie is the critters' language is subtitled. There's one scene where the critters are on the front porch of the house and they're talking about something. The mother points a shotgun out the door and blows up the one crite, and the other one in subtitles yells, Fuck! He said, They have weapons? No one told us they had weapons. <laughs> He's like, fuck this! <laughs> yeah. And this film does have a pretty strong cast. We mentioned D. Wallace playing another horror movie matriarch. M. Emmett Walsh is the drunk town sheriff who's very amusing. What do you think of Charlie? The town drunk and Faulkner-esque man-child Charlie. He's alright. I don't think he really fits as the series hero. Yeah, he becomes the connecting thread between all four of these films. Like some people would say the Critters are the connecting thread. Beyond that, ultimately Critters is a mostly silly sci-fi monster movie. But there ain't nothing wrong with that. Grover's Bend, it's just a speck on the map of the universe. They get a different class of tourist here. Noisier, pushier. They're turning this peaceful little town into dinner. Those hungry hairballs from outer space are on a roll. Critters 2, the main course. If you like the first Critters, odds are good you're going to like Critters 2 almost as much. I almost like it better. Yeah, I kind of do too because it's a bigger movie. Obviously, Critters was a reasonable success for New Line. And I think the company was still high on the success of the Nightmare on Elm Street sequels. So they said, let's do another horror franchise. So Critters 2 got the green light. It takes place a few years later. We're still in Grover's Bend. The events that happened at the Brown family home have already passed into local legend. Brad, Scott Grimes' character, the youngest son, comes back to town for the first time in a while. We didn't mention the sequel hook at the end of the first movie. How there are some eggs in the chicken coop and in this those eggs hatch so apparently when you eat a shitload of chicken you lay an egg <laughs> apparently yeah like clockwork the remaining crite eggs hatch might be worth noting that this one takes place on Easter it does and there aren't a lot of Easter set horror movies a neat novelty the reason the eggs are found is because somebody buys them for an Easter egg hunt grandmother of Scott Grimes' character yeah actually. who is amusingly a strict vegetarian when a critter gets into her fridge it spits out the vegetables and yells at her <laughs> blasted meat eaters or something, <laughs> something like that something like that yeah Bounty Hunters from Space are back, too. This one is almost a more blatant ripoff of Gremlins, because now the Critters are let loose on the whole town. Yes. There's even a scene where the Critters are chewing on some phone lines that feels very much like a Gremlins thing. Yep. More people are threatened. Puppets are more expressive and detailed. The Critters have a little more personality in this one. And the content in this is a little edgier, too. There's a little more violence. The guy in the Easter Bunny suit getting eaten. A Critter rolls into his suit. The zipper hole. In yeah, his... flies up his fly, and then he throws himself through the church window. There's and a... that's how those kids found out there was no Easter Bunny. <laughs>
a scene that made you laugh out loud in this, and this is the money shot in this movie, all the Krites congregate into one big ball, and they roll down the field, and they roll over a guy, and strip him down to the bone. I mean, it's art, man. And speaking of the edgier content in this movie, there is some nudity in this. And I had no idea how this film got a PG-13. Because it's blatant. Ugg, the space bounty hunter's back, and his partner is back. Like I said, they have no face in their natural state. So throughout the whole movie, he's looking for forms to assume. And he picks up a porno mag, and assumes the form of the centerfold to the point where it still has the staple in her chest her breasts are in full view and it's gratuitous and I have no idea how this movie got a PG-13 it is full of TNA so goofier than the first one the amusing scene where the Wrights attack a fast food restaurant yeah oh what's the name of the something heifer it's the, the happy heifer the happy heifer and the, okay. and the theme song is something like happy the heifer happy heifer yeah a Krite gets the top of his hair shot off so he's bald one gets cooked in the deep fryer Eddie Dezen is in this movie playing a very Eddie Dezen like type the second bounty hunter is looking for a form to assume and you see him staring at something very intently and the camera pans around and it's a standee of Freddy Krueger <laughs> which they should have done yeah he should have become Freddy and then it could have been Freddy versus the Critters like I said none of these movies are high art the first one and the second one are the peak of the franchise they're pretty decent 80s monster movies after their first visit you thought they were destroyed but they return and they're getting bigger after the second encounter you thought the fuzzy devils were dead but you were wrong the critters are back. They've just rolled into the big city in search of new neighbors. And they're never late for dinner. Critters 3. You are what they eat. Critters 3 came along in 1991, and this is the turning point of the series. The Critters 3 is still fun. Gremlins 2 was set in the big city. Okay, well, Critters 3 has to be set in the big city. Gremlins 2 was set in one building, <laughs> so Critters 3 has to be set in one building. Yeah, it's set in an apartment. It's not a high-tech clamp tower. It's a really dingy, shitty apartment complex, because these are low-budget films. The plot in this one is very routine. Family on the road, they stop by Grover's Bend. Some crites that have survived sneak on, they come to the city, and shenanigans ensue. Charlie's back, and he's grabbed graduated from the town drunk to, I think they're trying to turn him into a badass in this one. In this one, he's living in the woods and throwing grenades at people. They remind me of Burt Gummer in the Turner's films. No, it's more like the uncle from Return of the Killer Tomatoes. Okay, this is the acting debut of Leonardo DiCaprio. You think he puts this on his resume? He better. <laughs> Oscar winning. He actually has never won an Oscar. Oscar nominated. Yeah, actor. Oscar nominated. Whatever. What's no, your point, Zach? Not nominated for this movie. There's only five rights in this one. Now, the movie makes it count. One rolls through some bleach, gets a big scar down his face. Apparently, bleach is like acid to the critters. I don't know what bleach would do if you threw it in your face, but I would not try it. <laughs> I don't think it'd go... <laughs> And you see smoke flying. This is notable for me. This movie came out in 1991, so it was in production before any of the Sonic the Hedgehog games hit the public. It's not an intentional thing. Something the Krites do in this film is they roll into a ball and then speed up and then they launch off. Anybody who's played a Sonic the Hedgehog game knows that that's called a spin dash. A team where the Krites attack a kitchen and they're drumming and flour. One drinks some deodorant and belches up bubbles. <laughs> does have some fun killing off the monsters. One is cut in half with a meat cleaver. One has a flare shoved down its mouth and it burns up. You see a skeleton glowing? Yeah. The... the leader, Krite, gets shot with some fireworks and shoots up into the sky and explodes. But overall, this one, it's not terrible, but it is much more tedious. Characters are not as interesting. They lost their mother, and the daughter has been trying to convince the father to grieve, and he's holding back. They resolve their problems by the end. Yeah, who cares? It's not without its moments. You've seen them wreak havoc on Earth. The last two eggs were launched into orbit, and now they're having a blast in outer space. The killer hairballs have relocated and have a new place to play. They're dining from an all-new menu of cosmic cuisine, but they'd rather eat on Earth. Critters 4, they're invading your space. Critters 3 ends on a cliffhanger, a space probe landing in the apartment complex, and Ugg's face appears on a hologram and says to Charlie, the Krites are an endangered species now, and you can't destroy the last couple eggs. Charlie puts the eggs in the probe, and that's the end of part 3. And part 4 picks up with Charlie getting stuck in the probe and shot back into space, and he floats through space for 50 years. Critters 4 is Critters in Space. Why is it usually the fourth film in Hellraiser 4 was Hellraiser in Space? Hellraiser 4 was more Hellraiser in the future. Yeah, Hellraiser through the ages. Even 
even though most people say the franchise has jumped the shark when you go into space, it makes a little more sense for Critters because it's always been sci-fi. Yeah, but not all franchises jump the shark when they go to space. Yeah, because Friday the 13th jumped the shark long before they ever got to space. Bit Leprechaun. Oh yeah, that's another one. That's also a part four in space, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but the best Leprechaun movie is... It is, yeah, it is. Leprechaun anyway. in space. Technically, Leprechaun movies are little monsters, but that's a different episode. We actually marathoned these movies. It was late at night, and we were both kind of tired. JD didn't make it all the way for Critters 4. I've seen it all before. And it's definitely the weakest of the series, because one of the big problems with this movie, because it's set in space, you can tell the budget went to the sets, so there was less money for the Critters. And there's only two Critters in this movie. That's terrible. There's also really big name actor. Well, not big name actors, this one, but... This one has a cast with some notable names in it. Oscar nominated no, She won that Oscar, didn't she? I think she was only nominated. Angela Bassett is in this movie, who in 1992 was a big name. I just come off of What's Love Got to Do With It, which was... What's a, Love Got to Do? I assume this film was shot before the Tina Turner movie. I can't imagine after that she didn't have any time for Critters 4. Brad Dorff in a rare heroic part. Bangers and Mash favorite, Angers Hove. Outside of makeup, still a creepy fucker. The guy who played Leo from Twin Peaks is in this, playing a very similar role. And even the voice of the computer is a recognizable name. That's Martin Beswick, who did a bunch of Hammer movies on a couple Bond films. The film does have that going for it, but there's not enough critters in this. Not enough monster action in general. Plot twist at the end where Ugg becomes an asshole. A shootout between him and Charlie, which I dislike. The Critters franchise ends on a down note. Three out of four ain't bad. Three out of four ain't bad. Out of all of the Gremlins ripoffs, I think it is fair to say that the Critter series is probably the most accomplished. Probably. Jonathan is having a housewarming party. Unfortunately, there will be some surprise guests. They have very bad manners. And they have no respect for privacy. And they never take no for an answer. Once they show up, you can never get rid of them. Ghoulies. They'll get you in the end. What's the other somewhat long-running Gremlins rip-off series? Ghoulies. Ghoulies. Are any of the Ghoulies movies good? No. No. They are... All right, we're done with the Ghoulies. Let's move on. <laughs> no, no, no. I've watched all four of these fucking movies. We're going to talk about them. Ghoulies 1 from 1985. This is a Charles Band production. This is from Empire Pictures, the precursor to Full Moon. And this film has the dubious distinction of being the first Gremlins rip-off to make it on the market. And the reason for that is they had an unrelated screenplay that they had already put into production. Band saw the numbers Gremlins was doing. And being a man has never met a successful family didn't want to rip off. He said, rewrite the script so that these little monsters that have a very small role have a bigger role. And thus Ghoulies was born. The little monsters don't have much to do in the first Ghoulies. It's not really about them. They're just set dressing. Yeah, they're not. What Ghoulies is about begins with this satanic ritual. This baby is to be sacrificed to this evil sorcerer. Somebody sneaks the baby out. Fast forward a decade and that baby has grown up to a guy named Jonathan. And he moves with his girlfriend into his childhood home, this spooky mansion. Spooky mansion. Forces from beyond call to Jonathan to fulfill his satanic birthright. He puts on a robe, he starts speaking in a demon voice, starts taking a pitchfork around, the titular ghoulies are summoned, his warlock father is resurrected. What ghoulies is, to me, is a collection of unrelated horror movie ideas. There's a bunch of really weird shit happening in this movie. It quickly escalates from drawing a pen and graph in the basement to him being evil and shit, his eyes glowing. He brainwashes his girlfriend, he offers up his friends as sacrifices. The ghoulies show up for a couple of scenes, they're not important. His evil undead warlock father running around. He turns into a woman and seduces Guy and kills him with his tongue. There are a pair of dwarves named Grizzle and Greedy Gut that are summoned and contribute not a thing to the plot. I don't remember Drizzle and Julie Gut. They're just two dwarves in brown robes. They talk in rhyme thrown in there. There's a creepy clown doll running around. Was Poltergeist out yet? I'm going to assume that they ripped that off from Poltergeist. There's a heroic wizard named Wolfgang who's played by David Lynch regular Jack Nance. He's like in the very beginning and the very end. He has no interaction with the characters throughout the rest of the film. He literally shows up at the very end just to rescue them. So we'll actually rip that off of Ghoulies then. I, I don't think that was an intentional ripoff. The only thing this movie has going for it is the characters are really, really weird. There's a character named Mark who talks in this gravelly voice. He has a split personality that he calls Toad Boy. There's a pair of guys. They get stoned. They do these spasmodic dances on the floor. They ride around on dirt bikes. Ghoulies is a weird, weird movie. It's not good in any traditional sense of the word. No, it's not. But I do like the Ghoulies themselves, though the roles are brief. The thing that this movie was sold on was that fucking poster of the Ghoulie sticking its head out of the toilet and the tagline, they'll get you in the end. And that scene, notably, does not occur in this film. You do not actually see somebody sitting on the commode and getting bit in the ass by a ghoulie, which I think people were disappointed about. 
The carnival's back in town with all your old favorites. The Ferris wheel, the spook house, bumper cars, and a special added attraction. It's got ghoulies, too. They walk, they talk, they crawl on their bellies like... Reptile! Just when you thought it was safe to go back into the bathroom. Ghoulies, too. They'll get you in the end again. This is a problem that the sequel rectifies. <laughs> uh, rectifies. You made it funny. I made it funny. Yeah, it. I didn't even. Ghoulies Two is the closest the Ghoulies franchise comes to being a genuinely good film. Okay, wouldn't agree with that. No, this is the closest though, right? It's all right, dude. But really, it's Ghoulies fucking two. <laughs> This one is much more of a blatant Gremlins ripoff. The monsters take center stage. It begins with a priest being chased by a satanic cult. He has a bag, and the ghoulies are in that. They kill him, chance would have it, that a truck containing attractions for a carnival is parked across the street. The ghoulies jump on the truck. They head to a carnival. So this movie is ghoulies at a carnival. There's five types of ghoulies. There's the green fish ghoulie. There's, there's the leader. Who's the leader? There's the cat ghoulie. There's the rat ghoulie. The flying ghoulie. And this one introduces the weird lizard ghoulie. They gnaw on people. There's a couple who are making out, and they spray green slime on them and glue them together. Which is amazing. Guy gets wrapped up like a mummy. This one fulfills the promise of the poster. Somebody sits on the toilet and gets bitten in the ass. The most amazing scene in this movie is the end, how they defeat the ghoulies, where they summon a giant ghoulie who eats the smaller ghoulies, and then is defeated himself when he eats a gorilla suit full of dynamite and explodes. And now you're telling me none of that appeals to you. Now, here's the question. If... Guns and shit don't kill the regular ghoulies. How is a suit full of dynamite going to kill the giant ghoulies? Yeah, I think you're asking the wrong questions, bub. This one does make good use of the carnival setting. Ghoulies doing shit like play with a target game. They run somebody over with a bumper car. They dismantle a tilt to whirl while the people are on it. They go spinning off. Come on, man. That shit's fun. I don't really care for it. I don't care for any of these. They're all bad. I think Ghoulies 2 is the closest the series comes to being good. I disagree. I like one the best. It's prank week at Glazier College, and the prank boys are out for blood. But what these party animals don't realize is they've got three new pledges from hell. Now, the ghoulies are about to learn what higher education is all about. Brewskies, babes, and partying hardy. They may flunk out on manners, but they get an A in mayhem. We both agree that two is better than three, right? Yeah. Yeah, three is the Nadir. Ghoulies three, ghoulies go to college. I'll admit that this one kind of entertained me a little bit. Ooh, I found this one painful. By 1991, Empire Pictures was no more. The rights to the Ghoulies franchise wound up at Vesteron Video. This film went straight to video. It was directed by John Carl Blucher, who had done all the special effects up to this point, and also directed Friday the 13th Part 7, which is my favorite Jason movie. What's the premise as it is of Ghoulies 3? College shenanigans ensue. This Comic book gets picked up. Yeah, there's a satanic comic book that summons ghoulies out of a satanic toilet. This movie's a really crappy Gremlins ripoff matched together with a really crappy Animal House ripoff. Yeah. That's fair. What I find difficult to swallow about this film is the really broad, bad comedy. One of the first things in the movie is Kane Hodder grabs a janitor's bucket, rides it down the stairs. That's the level of humor we're on here. That was Kane Hodder? That was Kane Hodder. Holy shit! I met that guy. <laughs> there's a couple that has enthusiastic sex on workout equipment to the point where they have a fetish for having sex on workout equipment. If you pay attention, it's just the girl that has the fetish. That's true, that's true. Jason Scott Lee is in this movie and tries to impress women with his stereo setup and it worked. That was Jason that, Scott that Lee? That was Jason Scott Lee, yeah. That's Do you so think much. he puts this on his resume? Uh, That was Jason Scott Lee. <laughs> There's a security guard who is obsessed with his golf cart. There's a panty raid. That guy was somebody. The only recognizable name in the movie is Kevin McCarthy as the Dean. And he's maybe the only thing about this movie that I like. He's having fun. He's hamming it up. What do you think about the ghoulies talking? The ghoulies should not talk. Unless they drank a brain serum first. Little monsters should not speak in articulated sentences. You know, Shut up. I really hated ghoulies through it. It's too sleazy. There's too many fart jokes. Now his tormentors are back. In person and in leather. The legend continues. Because they're back. It's Muggers, Zero, and Ghoulies 4. A satanic story with something for everyone. Like what? Drugs, weird sex, ritualistic stuff, black magic, devil worship. Ghoulies 4, putting the sin back in Sinister.
Ghoulies 3 is just bad, bad. Ghoulies 4, can you fucking believe they made four of these movies, is good, bad. This is a hilarious, bad movie. It has very little to do with the rest of the film. The only real connection, the actor from the first movie, Peter Priapus from the first movie, returns as Jonathan. He becomes a cop. He has this history of satanic magic and kinky sex and a lot of ex-girlfriends. He investigates a break-in at a warehouse where his dominatrix ex-girlfriend killed some cops, opened a portal to hell, let in two ghoulies. She wants to bring Jonathan's evil demon self back from hell. This film is completely insane. It opens with a blonde babe in leather killing people with ninja stars. Then there's a shootout in a liquor store. Random Jackie Gleason and Art Carney impersonator show up. Then there's another shootout in a liquor store. There's an insane asylum run by actual inmates. A woman is trapped in a car. The car is taken over by Satan. Satan mocks her from the radio and crashes the car into a telephone pole. Jonathan shoots lasers out of his hands. Why? You're asking the wrong questions, bub. The guy is having a kung fu fight in a warehouse, steps into a pentagram and just shoots one laser beam out of his hands and makes another guy disappear. The funniest thing about Ghoulies 4 is that it wasn't Peter Liapis' midlife crisis, but it feels like it is. The whole plot is motivated by his ex-girlfriend wanting to have sex with him again. His police chief is his ex-girlfriend. His current ex-girlfriend is a hooker. Every woman in this movie wants his dick, which runs in contrast to his behavior where he's an alcoholic. He falls asleep mid-sentence. You notice I haven't mentioned the Ghoulies. They contribute nothing to the plot. And instead of being puppets, they're played by dwarfs in suits. Oh, God, Tech. There's a white one and a black one, and they are literally called the white one and the black one. The black one's played by Tony Cox from Bad Santa. The mouths on their masks barely move. They look at porn and beat up an Asian repairman. I could just picture them beating him with saying racial slurs at the same time. <laughs> it's thought. not quite that racist. <laughs> you can't say this film is boring because something ridiculous is happening every minute of its runtime. I recommend this one if you're in the mood for something insane. Once upon a time when the world was filled with wonder, little creatures shared the earth with humans. Once upon a time is now. Empire Pictures presents Troll. The weirdest, the rowdiest, the most mischievous, and the scariest little creature of them all. Harry Potter Jr. expected to have a little trouble getting adjusted in his new neighborhood, but he never expected anything like that. Ghoulies was not the only Empire Picture ripoff of Gremlins. There was also Troll, also directed by John Carl Blucher. Though referring to Troll as a ripoff of Gremlins is a little disingenuous. It's a little more than that. This movie is actually a weird fusion of a family film and a fantasy movie. This one comes close to being sort of good. It's definitely not bad. I don't know that it's good, but it's not bad. The Potter family moves into a new apartment. Father Harry and Mother <laughs> Anne <laughs> are upstairs packing. That is not intentional, by the way. No, it's not. The main character of this movie is Harry Potter Jr. The little girl goes into the basement, and apparently there's a portal to a magical nether realm in the basement. Korok, the Troll King, switches places with her, takes over her appearance. Korok is a troll from another dimension. Using his magical ring, he transforms the other tenants in the apartment into monsters and turns their apartments into weird swamp lands. They're not just monsters. They're fairies and trolls. It's a fantasy hodgepodge, and it's up to Harry Potter Jr. to save the day with the help of the friendly witch who lives in the apartment, played by June Lockhart, the mom from Lost in Space. This one is a weird fantasy film, and I kind of admire it for that. You read books about quote-unquote fairies, and acknowledges that in the original myth, fairies or fae were not nice creatures. Back in 1986, there was a novelty to that. Weird images of the troll turning people into pea pods. A really effective sequence. The daughter befriends the dwarf that lives in the building, and he's an English teacher, and she has him read the poem The Fairy Queen. And while he's reading this in one room and the other room where all the trolls are they start singing a genuinely eerie moment there is stuff in this movie that works and is weird but in an effective way but there is a lot of cheesy stuff in this movie too do you remember Sonny Bono? no <laughs> Sonny Bono plays the swinger oh yeah I remember I didn't realize it was Sonny Bono out of all the actors you could cast as the hip swinger sex addict Sonny Bono, really. The little girl, when she's possessed by the troll, starts screaming about rat burgers, which is really weird. Julie Louise Dreyfus of Seinfeld fame, <laughs> is in this movie and gets turned into a naked nymph. People forget that she actually had a career before Seinfeld killed it. I think Seinfeld made her career and simultaneously killed it. Do you think she puts this on her resume? Do you remember how this movie ends with the little brother walking into the fantasy world and saving his little sister from this giant monster and then just ends? This movie also has Michael Moriarty in it, who is a great character actor, and there's a scene that has nothing to do with the rest of the movie, where he does a dance to a hard rock cover of Summertime Blues. I don't think that was scripted. They just put the camera on Michael Moriarty and he just did that by himself. So you can't
can't call the first roll a good movie, but I think it is interesting. Yeah. For a couple of years now, they've been trying to make a remake. They want to cash in on the fact that this was the first Harry Potter. Thus far, that has not surfaced. They're eating her. And then they're going to eat me. Oh my god! Troll has a legacy, though, and it is an interesting legacy indeed. Without the first Troll, there would be no Troll 2. Oh, man, this movie. I was aware that there was a film called Troll 2. I had seen the VHS box and video stores, but it wasn't until the internet came along that I realized this movie was one of these legendary, hilarious, bad movies. The Ringer, let everybody eat me! Oh my god! god! Infamously, Troll 2 features no trolls. The monsters in this movie are actually goblins. This film is yet another in the long, proud tradition, unofficial Italian knockoff sequels. The movie takes place in a town called Nilbog, which is goblin backwards. Oh, man. <laughs> totally miss that. <laughs> the plot of this movie is this little boy is still having visits from his grandfather, even though his grandfather died. The grandfather warns him about the goblins. As fate would have it, his family moves to Nilbog. They're doing some sort of exchange program. Nilbog is inhabited by vegetarian goblins. There are so many weird things about Troll 2, but I think the tie... Like why if they're vegetarian goblins so they turn people into plants so that they can eat them? Yeah, this movie has an anti-vegetarian agenda, but the writers of the film seem to misunderstand what vegetarians are. Most people who are vegetarians object to eating animals. The goblins in this movie kill people and then turn them into vegetables. This weird green slime that seems to be all they eat. You can't piss on the corn. Yeah, you can't piss on hospitality. The acting in the this movie is inexplicable. It's so bad that it almost reaches another state of being. All the acting in the movie is bad. Like, the main characters and the minor characters. It's like everybody in this movie is on drugs. Everybody in that movie probably was on drugs. Do you remember the evil town librarian who I guess is the central villain of the film? Yeah, isn't she like a witch? Do you remember that character's name? Was it Nilbog? Credence Leonor Gilgod. Every performance in this movie makes you scratch your head and go, what the fuck am I watching? Her performance is an accumulation of all the other bad acting in this movie. Despite being a ghost, Grandpa can freely interact with people in the movie. He chops off a goblin's hands. He hauls down lightning from the heavens and sets a fan on fire. If my grandfather could do that, I probably wouldn't fuck with him. Bizarre subplot about the daughter. Her boyfriend hangs out with his buddies. I think they're a little too close, because there's a scene where they're all shirtless lying in bed together, and he has to choose between his girl and his friends. Well, the girl wins out every time. All the weird shit in this movie, I think the weirdest scene, which is really saying something, is the popcorn seduction scene. I don't remember you the don't. Pop- Credence Leonore Gilgod turns herself into a hot girl. She finds one of the guys, and she seduces him with a corn cob. They're both chewing on both ends of the corn cob, and they're making out so hot and heavy that the corn pops into popcorn and fills the entire room. I remember that. Every minute of this movie, while you're watching it, you think, somebody wrote this dialogue. Somebody gave that dialogue to actors. Actors said that dialogue in front of a camera. At no point in the production did anybody say, what the hell are we doing? And that is the true appeal of Troll 2. How is it possible that this film was made? The director of this film insisted to say that he did not make a bad movie, that Troll 2 is a good film. Maybe he's right. If Troll 2 was a truly terrible film, you would not have hundreds of people on the internet watching it all the time, quoting it endlessly. It's not that this movie is boring. It's very entertaining. At the end of the day, isn't that really why you watch a movie? To I mean, be Entertained. It is fascinating in its curiousness. You're sitting there in the dark. But don't worry. There's nothing to be afraid of. We're going to go through these real quick. I've got some other titles on my list here. Don't Be Afraid of the Dark. The original from 1973 actually predates Gremlins. And you've never seen the original TV version of Don't Be Afraid of the Dark. Correct the mundo. I have. It's a pretty good movie. It stars Ken Darby. Has a good use of shadow. For a television film, it has a really good atmosphere. Something the remake would follow up on. These voices that whisper, Sally, has a very dark ending. When they remade Don't Be Afraid of the Dark a few years back, Camillo del Toro was a huge fan of the TV movie. And he did not direct the remake. But I feel like this is Steven Spielberg and Toby 
Toby Hooper on Poltergeist case, where the producer takes over the remake of Don't Be Afraid of the Dark from 2011. It's basically a Del Toro film. Oh, yeah. Clear down to them being tooth fairies. He has this weird obsession with the tooth fairy and imps in this film. In the first movie, they're these strange, hairy, they look like little Sasquatch. And in this one, they are much more rat-like and they eat teeth. And they make the main character from a grown woman to a little girl. So the film has strong elements of Pan's Labyrinth. It is a direct remake. She's attacked in the shower by the creatures. She's at the dinner table and a creature starts pulling on her dress. She's being dragged into the basement by the monsters. All of this is straight out of the original. Okay. Though the ending is a little different. I really like the remake. really like the lead actress. Bailey Madison was the little girl. The Blackthorn Manor mansion was a really cool setting. Yeah. We actually saw it in the theaters together. That was a top film of the year for me. I enjoyed Don't Be Afraid of the Dark. And there are, there are other movies that came in the wake of Gremlins like Munchies. That was the New World Pictures Roger Corman. I've never seen it. You've never seen it. But I bet you've seen the poster of the little gray monster with the mohawk and a beer in one hand and a cigar in the other and he's looking up woman's dress. I think so. You'd have to show it to me. It stars Harvey Corman. It's supposed to be more of a comedy. There's the infamous Hobgoblins that was featured on Mystery Science Theater. Pretty hysterically bad film. The Gate, which I haven't seen in years, but I remember little monsters in that. Kid plays the record backwards and that opens a gateway mm-hmm. to hell in his backyard. A young Stephen Dorff is the main character in that, I think. I remember enjoying The Gate, but I haven't seen it in like a decade. Well, then there's The Gate 2. Are there any little monsters in Gate 2? No. Gate 2 is bad. The two boys from the first one, they're in college now. They get possessed with demons. You just can't learn not to play a record backwards, can you? Hmm. Well, I'm sure there are other little monster movies that we haven't thought of here. Uh, Blood Gnomes? Isn't that a... There's a movie called Blood Gnomes, I think. I'm sure there's gotta be a killer gnome movie. Oh, there has to be, right? There was a Gremlin episode of, of Charmed. It was uh, there. Yes. And I know So Weird did a Gremlins episode. Small little malevolent creatures is a common enough premise that it shows up from time to time in genre television. Mm-hmm. I don't know why the idea of a bunch of little monsters appeals to me so much. I love movies with giant monsters. I love movies with man-sized monsters. Maybe the idea of a bunch of small monsters, it's like, hey, more bang for your buck. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I really like Gremlins and Gremlins 2. Gremlins are great. The first two critters aren't bad. Most of the Ghoulies movies are terrible. All of the Ghoulies movies are terrible. Don't Be Afraid of the Dark was good. Yeah. Beasties was another low-budget Gremlin ripoff that I've never seen. It's very hard to get a hold of. This was an incoherent episode, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, this one sucked. I'm sorry, guys. It was my fault. I've got it on tape. He said it. Usually his fault, but this time it was mine. Is this strictly an 80s thing? Do you think we'll see more of these some days? I don't think it's done, but I don't think we're going to see movies focused specifically around them. There will be segments to the movie that'll have little monsters in it, like Hellboy 2 yeah, yeah. with the Tooth Fairies. Yeah. Maybe video games are to blame, because the little annoying creature is a reoccurring villain in most fantasy action video games. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure that whenever there's a fantasy film, we will have something if you can remember the name of that Little Monsters movie that had Malcolm McDowell and it was something like Trapped or Encased or something like that, email us at thebangersinmashshow88 at yahoo.com. Look us up on the Facebook group, www.facebook.com slash thebangersinmashshow. Follow me on Twitter at LastMonsterKid. My blog is www.zaxfilmthoughts.blogspot.com. Thanks to all our listeners, as always. The show would not exist without you. We would have given up on this thing a long time ago if people had not started liking the episodes and emailing us. Right. I'm going to go off and be a bit of a little monster myself, okay? All right, but remember, you can't eat after midnight. Oh. Look out for the darkness, hold on to your soul. It's a call.